uh, we'll move on to our next uh, lightning talks. Uh, and it couldn't be better timed. Uh, this is a lightning talk on extreme climate events and reinsurance. And so this is featuring uh, Adam Sobel, who's a colleague in, in my Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia, and Stephen Weinstein. So, Adam? You can just use it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just using this mic, so if I walk away from it, and you can't hear me, please yell at me. I may become distracted and, and do that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, OK. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not really going to present a scientific paper. I'm not going to show a lot of results. I'll show a couple. Uh, but I'm going to try to frame a problem. So much, much of my career has spent, uh, been spent on what I would describe as basic research, just trying to understand how the atmosphere works. And in the last couple of years, and to a much greater extent right now, I'm uh, reorienting uh, a significant fraction of my effort to work on pragmatic problems of, um, of, of interest that are in line with the vision that Peter spelled out at the beginning of trying to make um, the science that we do uh, directly relevant to to uh, real concern. And so I'm going to, the problem we're working on is one that uh, many of us don't immediately understand until we think about it. So I'm going to try and spend most of my time just explaining what the problem is and the, and the broad sense of how we solve it. And then the next speaker, Steve Weinstein, with whom I'm honored to uh, share this slot, is going to show you, I believe, some more specific results along the same lines. Um, so uh, the, 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 a lot of the leading edge of climate change is natural catastrophes, natural hazards. That's where we really feel the impacts most greatly. Um, not just climate change, but just natural variability in the climate we live in. That's where a lot of the risk comes in. And a lot of the, a large fraction of the losses of the damage of any kind, whether it's financial or loss of life or livelihood or anything else from natural disasters comes from the few biggest ones. In statistical language, which is probably understood by many people uh, in finance, the distribution is fat tails, meaning a few big events do most of the damage. And those events are, those big events are rare, and sometimes they're so rare that they, they appear to us to be unprecedented. <coughs> they're rare enough that we haven't seen one in, in our modern history. This is an example, so Hurricane Sandy, these are, this is tracks of all the storms that came within some distance of New Jersey since we have data, which is the mid-19th century or so. And you can see, just by looking at the track alone, that Sandy was an outlier. It's this one coming in at a, at a red line. Um, it just came in at a steeper angle to the coast than any other storm before that. All the other ones kind of come up and graze, and that one came in at a sharp angle. And that was one of the reasons, no, by not, no means the only reason, but it was one of the reasons it was so destructive, because it pointed the winds right into New York Harbor, where the storm surge could be the worst. So it's just an example of how a lot of the damage comes from very rare events that we haven't seen before. Um, this is another way of seeing that. This is a time series showing all the big um, storm surges in New York Harbor since we have data, which is a couple of hundred years. And without, you don't even need to know the numbers. This is just how high the water got in New York Harbor in all these hurricanes. And you can see that although there were some events about as big as Sandy back in the, um, in 1788, 1821, so about 200 years before, there was nothing of that magnitude in between. So if you wanted to say, what's the risk to New York City of, uh, of an event like Sandy? in some average sense, and therefore what's the value of any mitigation measure we might take? You'd have to somehow measure the average cost, but since these events are so rare, you have to measure the average over you know, 500 or 1,000 years. And we don't have data like that, we just can't do it. And so this is the, the fundamental problem, is that um, with other kinds of things that happen regularly, we can sort of measure the cost, but with, with natural disasters it's difficult just because of the sheer rareness of it. Um, and so this is a quote it's some, attributed in this report, in uh, this risky business report that was written about the risk of climate change business by Bloomberg. Uh, the quote is, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's actually, I, I've since learned, it's not originally Bloomberg, but it's Peter <laughs> Drucker. But anyway, the question is, how do we measure disaster risk? And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time. Uh, in the report, this is a picture showing the expected flooding from a 100-year storm. So it's, um, and this was written after Sandy, but, uh, but it could have been written before. And it's, uh, so there's some flood levels. How high does it get once in 100 years on average? And this was produced by a company called Risk Management <coughs> Solutions, which is one of the companies that does this for the insurance industry. And so now I'm going to give you a sense of how this is done. How do you know it's one in 100 years when you only have 100 or maybe 200 years of data? Um, so we do what's called catastrophe modeling. And what, we, what is done is we generate large sets of synthetic events. In this case, it's artificial hurricanes that have the characteristics of the real ones but are slightly different in what we think are realistic ways so that we can generate some artificial histories that are much longer. And from those, we can sample the full event space and we can see the probability of an event so rare that it's never happened before. And you always have to worry about whether it's right because by nature, 
of the game, you're pushing yourselves outside the limits of what's actually in, in the data. But this is what we have to, to try to do. And these models, um, this is an example uh, from a paper by one of my colleagues, Tim Hall, and it's showing uh, several realizations of artificial hurricane tracks. So the one on the upper left is all the hurricane tracks in the Atlantic that are act have actually been observed since about 1851. And the others are all synthetic realizations of those. So many, many synthetic histories, and from these we can estimate uh, there's events in there that aren't in the real data. So you could estimate the, the risk of Sandy. Uh, Tim and I actually uh, uh, wrote a paper shortly after Sandy that estimated that a track like that, on average, happens once in every 700 years, but, uh, which is a result that's easy to misinterpret. But I don't want to uh, talk about that. These, these models are not done in the same way as our computer models that are used to predict um, weather every day or that are used to predict climate in the way that um, Peter Hoeders talked about. Those solve the full equations of physics. That turns out to be too expensive and too difficult to, to simulate hurricanes at the resolution we need to simulate them over the period of time uh, that we need to do it. So these models are what's called stochastic models. They take the data and they look at what the tracks look like and they generate, um, using some simple statistical rules, tracks that look like that. And, and what look like that means is, is uh, something we could, you know, that's a subject of scientific uh, debate, but, but in some way they do that. So it's simpler and cheaper and you can do it very fast. But then, of course, you have to worry about um, whether you're, since you're extrapolating from the historical data, you have to worry about whether the future is going to be like the past or not, because these tracks occurred in the past climate and the future climate may be different. So you have to be careful about how you do that. And you, you'd ideally like to incorporate more physics in order to be able to capture um, the future, because in the future the laws of physics will still be true, although the climate may have changed and the hurricane tracks may could be different. Um, so the, this kind of capacity model has actually been developed in the insurance industry, it's the uh, it's it's an area where we in academia have actually been following what the private sector has been doing, uh, because the people in insurance realized at least about 30 years ago uh, that they had a need to do this to understand the risk of rare events, because that's where all the losses were coming from. So, the insurance industry has a, has a developed models like this. There are several companies that are quite good at doing it. Um, these are some pictures from um, promotional materials from several of them. Um, at the bottom, RMSAR, Equicap, they're great scientists at these places, and they do great work for the, for the industry, but they have several limitations as we think about the broader picture of, of uh, weather and climate risk. They're not open source, because the companies that do these things are trying to you know, sell solutions, so the, the, quite understandably, they want to protect their intellectual property, and, and so they don't publish all the details of how they do it, because it's crazy. Um, they're also based on historical data, and they don't handle climate change. Insurance contracts are written one year at a time, the insurance industry is not in denial about climate change at all. It's just that the business model is such that the time horizons are not long. And so as climate change uh, you know, happens, it'll be priced in is the idea. But, but as, as it stands, you can't use these models to think about a changing climate, at least not yet. And the other thing is that they're built to handle problems where the industry has significant exposure. So they're very interested in Atlantic hurricanes, because that's, there's a lot of property in the Atlantic coast that's insured. They're not so interested in a hurricane in Myanmar or, or uh, you know, on the east coast of India. But those are problems that are uh, those are places where the risk is still of interest from a broader you know, point of view of, of human society. So these are, um, these are all problems, and this is an area where in the academic sector we've only really begun to engage on this. We do tremendous amount of work on, on natural catastrophe risk, not just uh, on, on natural hazards, I mean hurricanes and tornadoes and droughts and floods and everything, but most of the work we do is not aimed at answering this question. What's the probability of event X, and what would the damage be? That's the other key part of these models, not just the probability of the event, but what the um, what the consequences would be. So, in the last few years, some of us, and now my, I count myself among them in, in, uh, recently, are starting to orient ourselves in this way to try to work to develop um, catastrophe models, that's what this kind of model is called, that can assess the risk of rare events and their consequences um, using peer reviewed science, open source, uh, handle climate change, and look at the whole world. Because we think that these problems are too important to be limited to one industry or one sector. Academia and universities and, and, and government scientists too have a role to play here so that the science is out there uh, for everyone to use for any purpose that you might want. It should, it should be. A, and that doesn't, in no way, denigrates or says we want to reduce the role of the, the private sector in insurance industry. They're critical, but, but we, we need them as partners. Um, so this is just one result I'm going to show. We've been, and I'm focusing on hurricanes just for the sake of specificity, but we can do this with other kinds of events. We've developed a, our own open source uh, tropical cyclone hazard model. I'm calling it here hazard model because so far, this is the language in the, in the, in the business. Hazard means the chance of the event itself, whereas uh, risk is hazard plus vulnerability plus 
consequences. So it's uh, the whole spectrum. And this model doesn't yet do the vulnerability and that. It just does the, um, the hazard. But with this model, we can estimate the risk of a tropical cyclone. And this is estimating it uh, along the coast of the North Indian Ocean. So it's um, India there and, uh, and Southeast Asia, Burma and Bangladesh on the right, and, and uh, the Arabian Peninsula on the left. The color tells you where on the coast you are. And at the bottom, you can see the probability of a landfall. The black line gives you the historical uh, landfall rates, don't worry about what the numbers actually mean, but it's just the height is relative. And then the colors are different realizations of our model, because it's stochastic, so it generates many histories, so we have a range of estimates. And we, we, we do pretty well at this measure, which is just the overall uh, rate at which, over time, over which hurricanes make landfall. What we're really interested in, of course, is something we can't verify with the historical data, which is the probability of an event so rare it hasn't happened. And we're now studying Mumbai. I won't get into the reasons why we're interested in Mumbai, but it's, as you know, it's a city with a lot, of, uh, a lot of people, a lot of value of many kinds. It's in a place where hurricanes are very rare in the Arabian Sea. They've never had a serious one in the modern history of the city, but the chance is not zero, and it's incredibly low-lying and vulnerable. It's a bunch of islands that were landfilled in in colonial times and up to the present. And, and if they were to get a big one, it would be tremendously catastrophic. So we're trying to understand that risk, and we need models like this uh, to do it. Um, our model, just to be, um, give a, a slight sense of what's in it, it has more physics than the industry models do, which means we think we can handle climate change. And we're building in how storms respond to climate rather than just extrapolating from a historical database. It has a little bit less physics than a model by a guy named Kerry Emanuel, who's really a, a tremendously great hurricane scientist and the one that first got me thinking about this problem, who has a very innovative uh, model to do this. Ours is somewhere in between these different approaches. We think this is a case where, as we do when we try to solve climate problems in academia that are hard, we need multiple approaches and multiple models and we compare them all. Um, we're starting to do this. We're starting to work with uh, industry and academic scientists together to think about this. This is a, a page from a, a Word document that is uh, not public, but um, it's a proposal for an intercomparison. This is something we do in academia when we have different models that do the same problem in different ways and we don't really fully understand exactly why they get different answers because we all not only have different models but we ask slightly different questions. <coughs> we try to all get together and ask the same question at the same time so that we know when we get different answers that the result is how we do it differently and that tells us what the state of the science is and gives us uh, ideas about how to move forward. So this is a project that we haven't we're just starting to put together with a number of us uh, academic scientists who work on this and a number of the top people from industry. And we're going to get everybody together. And as far as I know, this is the first time this has been done, a catastrophe model in a comparison with, um, with people from the two sectors. And, and we think it's an exciting moment to be in this field to see this, this happen. Um, I want to say just a few words about the role of climate change as a transition between the last uh, couple talks which address sea level rise and the next one which I think is going to do some even more and just say something about what the role of climate change is. Okay, thank you. Um, climate change, a, a lot of the, the risk we see now from, from hurricanes is what it's been historically, but over time climate change just changes them. Uh, natural variability is probably more important on short time scales than looking far into the future or even not so far in the case of sea level, climate change is a big impact. Um, when we're talking about hurricanes, the big impact that we're going to see, and it's no surprise given you that those of you who've been here all morning, is going to be seeing the coastal real estate due to sea level rise. And I won't explain this table at the bottom because I'm running out of time, but the bottom line is that <coughs> the storms themselves, of course, will change too due to uh, hurricanes, due to climate change. But uh, the, the sea level rise is really the big elephant in the room. And what this chart really says is that Sea level rise wins. It's the bigger factor because a little bit of sea level rise is equivalent, if you're worried about storm surge, which is the big, uh, big destroyer of property, a little bit of sea level rise just by starting to see at a higher level before the storm surge comes is the equivalent of a big change in storm intensity. And although storm intensity is probably going up, it's doing so slowly and the sea level rise is much faster. And so that's the big thing to worry about. And that actually cuts through some of the uncertainty because we understand sea level rise. Okay, I'm out of time. Um, I won't say anything more except the market could crash faster than uh, at some point than, um, than the, uh, it doesn't have to happen. All it has to happen is people think it's going to happen and that'll be it. Okay, so I'm out of time. There's some conclusions I'll leave up. I have some contact information and a plug for my book about Hurricane Sandy. And uh, Steve is going to pick it up from here and, uh, and, and say more about these same issues. Okay, Adam, um, thank you very much. I, I like that final slide. That's great. <laughs> Um, so we're very really pleased to welcome Steve Weinstein, who's uh, with uh, Renaissance Re Holdings. Uh, as a senior vice president there and chief legal officer. 
um, and it's a, lead, a leading global provider of property casualty and specialty reinsurance. So, Steve, welcome. Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning, everyone. Well, it's great to be here. It's good to be back in New York, uh, the country and city that I left 16 years ago to move to Bermuda, where I'm required by law my work permit to say good morning to you, to wear pink, which I have done, and to uh, speak slowly without vulgarity, habits I shed when I left New York. But in the interest of time, I may curb at least a couple of those recently adapted practices and go very fast. But it really is a delight to be here. When Peter and Adam invited me, I thought, will this audience be interested in our story and the opportunities that we see? I, I really wasn't sure. But with the tee up that I've had, both uh, Peter's remarks, Adam's presentation, which I endorse, uh, Christopher's remarks, and the question from the gentleman from Jupiter, uh, let me begin by saying yes, reinsurers care a lot about climate change. So let me go through what Adam posted. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> so, but freaking, I've spoken with Adam before, and I, I want to go first next time, Adam. Like all my <laughs> dogs and children are really brilliant people, which I'm not. But, with Adam, uh, but it, uh, in other uh, forums that we've spoken at, I've assumed that people may not know what reinsurance is, which I sometimes describe as the most interesting and largest business you may never have heard of. But as some speakers have noted today, right, the magic of insurance is to make exposures and perils more affordable by diversifying them. They do a great job with construction, detail, with types of auto exposure. But for events like earthquakes and hurricanes, flooding tend to concentrate risk. Right? So if you have a good portfolio of housing in Florida, you may have a terrific diversity of construction practices, but you've got the biggest concentration of insurable risk in the world, Florida storm flooding. Reinsurers play that role for insurance companies diversifying their risk into a more efficient global portfolio. So we do that for earthquakes, we do it for terrorism, and we do it for the rapidly rising climate-related risk of storm flooding and tornadoes. Right. Our market is big uh, and growing. Uh, these are kind of a snapshot and public. If you're raw materials capital, which is the case, com uh, that combined with intellectual property, uh, you tend to gravitate towards the global private markets to the most diversified source of capital. Uh, and again, the, the question came up, do reinsurers believe in climate change? I'll turn to our own views. In general, we do. So as I travel the world, speak to my peers, our competitors, it, we're the canary in the coal mine. We see the impacts already in this year's results when you get to look at a global portfolio. So I, I can't speak for all of our competitors, but I've yet to encounter someone who's in doubt about the rising risk of climate change and working to amend them in their business practices. A quick ad about us. Since I left New York, I've been at Renaissance Re, but I've been involved in Renaissance Re since it was formed. It's fun to see some of the more work Pink is here. My second assignment out of law school was Renaissance Re's second round of venture finance before Warburg. I typed out the stock certificates that were issued to Warburg to give you a sense of my <laughs> glorious early accomplishments. <laughs> but I did realize this is a terrific business plan. And the initial vision was to apply a new scientific approach to a centuries-old industry based upon the types of modeling techniques that Adam has described. Adam is right, those are prevalent in our industry today. But in 93, 94, 95, we were the first people to try. So I'm proud of our <coughs> science. I'm proud of the superior results that we've delivered to shareholders. I'm also proud of how we've tried to share those results with the public, with our clients, with communities, particularly where they can contribute to life safety. Uh, we've invested in real science, the Renaissance Free Wall of Wind, other applications, things like the Great Sheep Guide for Seismic. We've posted a lot of our content at mitigationleadership.com, and I invite you to visit there and see it. But we've also tried to share what we believe about the risks in our business with stakeholders, our clients, governments, and our investors. Uh, so this is our SEC filing. Uh, we're a public company. For us, a material risk it is our belief that we think the consensus science view, we know the consensus science view, is that anthropogenic climate change is happening, it's accelerating, in particular, it's increasing the risks of storms, making them more severe and more frequent. Landfall is complicated, but the severity and frequency of storms and floodings is up. And we're not academics, really, though we employ a lot of <coughs> academics. Those conclusions are embedded in our core business practices and how we think about risk every day. So the animations have dropped out of my slide, which is good, it'll make me go faster. Uh, but as we've heard, the seas are rising, the waters are hotter, that's contributing to risk. Okay. Uh, Christopher, I appreciate the TIA. Uh, nonetheless, why are prices going up in high risk area? Why is new construction accelerating? If reinsurance is the most interesting business some folks have never heard of, the most important subsidies for maladaptation that is badly recognized are state and federal insurance subsidies for insurance. Right? They're hidden. For example, the word insurance is used, which tends to induce boredom and nausea. <laughs> but these are enormous programs. These are the state residual markets for wind. More on flood in a second. 
So there are state agencies which sell homeowners insurance, principally wind. The public <coughs> policy purpose is to make homeowners insurance affordable. Uh, an outcome of that is to lie to people about their exposure. And from our perspective, to shift risk that we want to underwrite, business that we want to sell, that our clients want to access from the private market to the taxpayers. Yep. These are billions of dollars, so these are enormous risk allocation opportunities. You see this growth line over time. The success we've had recently, this drop down, is almost exclusively Florida. Florida is substantially the, large, the world's largest concentration of risk, and it's the world's, one of the world's largest homeless insurance companies, state agents in Florida. But through a mix of business reforms and commercial appetite, Florida's taxpayer risk has come down. That's been an enormous opportunity for private and public domestic insurance companies and reinsurance companies. So that's wind. In the United States, financing of flood is driven by the flood insurance program. And that'll touch about the problem with risk is that it's happening, but you can't always see it. So for years, the actuarial unsoundness of the flood program is masked by the non-occurrence of large floods. Uh, Sandy, Katrina, the flood events of last year have drawn back the curtain and shown the real exposure in the flood program. $25 billion of debt, which the very competent people who run the flood program, they're really terrific emergency ma managers and not insurance folks. Uh, but they acknowledge there is no way for them to pay back this debt. Every year, almost every policy they issue is actually unsound. They dig the hole deeper, subject to reform. The flood program is up. It needs to be reauthorized this fall. It's five year extension is due in September. So watch this space. But the scale of the flood program, I'll give you a cheap number. There is one to two trillion dollars of exposure in the flood program. Now that's NOAA's flood, right? That's the aggregate national risk of the flood program. We don't model that as a real probability, uh, even us. Uh, but that's in a, on the, the concomitant side of how much business is in the flood program is how much business opportunity there is if some of that risk is shared with the private market. Okay. Uh, and there is a growing consensus that that is a good public policy idea. That by uh, shifting risk and permitting the market-based, risk-based pricing signal to operate, we can send better land use decisions and stimulate an important area of business as well. Uh, this is a GEO report that came out uh, in 15. But this set of findings has been consistent, and I believe that the public policy consensus around that point of view is gaining some amount. Uh, and while the flood program's uh, reforms have been incremental so far, it has been enough to stimulate a very substantial growth of new American domestic insurance companies who are writing flood coverage. Uh, we didn't do it in the US for 50 years because we were crowded out by the flood insurance program, but that is changing very rapidly. And this is literally changing week to week. That's the insurance picture of selling insurance directly to consumers. There are also great opportunities in the reinsurance space. FEMA is a, is a federal program, so it can go to Treasury subject to the <coughs> decisions of Congress and borrow money from elsewhere. Uh, uh, to get a federal government agency to invest in risk transfer, in this case traditional reinsurance, is a milestone deal. This is the National Flood Insurance Program's January 1, 1, 1, first ever milestone reinsurance purchase, billion dollars, pretty big transaction. But against the one to two trillion dollars of exposures, it's just the first bite of an enormous apple. We're cautiously optimistic that MFIP will continue to explore sharing risk with the private market. We'll call that reinsurance, or there's opportunities for cap bonds, for ILS, for a range of products to relieve taxpayer risk and put private capital to work. Okay. But to do that, and we've lost the animation, so I apologize, uh, we need better tools than have been prevalent in the last 50 years while this risk has been on the backs of taxpayers. So, uh, the animation here, if you, if you folks email me, I'll get you to a Dropbox so you can see it. I'll try to give you some of the sense of how we have invested to understand our risk well and provide appropriate pricing to customers. This would show Duval County, and this is a simulation of understanding uh, floods don't know county borders. No, you want to understand where there's elevation, where the rivers flow, and importantly for flooding, tide cycles. <laughs> and again, we're, we'll miss this. We modeled for you, and I, I'm sorry the animation doesn't show up. We took Sandy, and Adam's right, Sandy's rare, but events like Sandy happen. And this is a simulation that we run, running Sandy about the same distance south of Washington, D.C. Oh, uh, Christopher, I'm glad you were watching here. And, uh, where, do the, where does the surge go? Right, so Washington is not coastal, it's not a barrier island, it's not Miami Beach. But an event like Sandy, it's a miss, this is a landfall south, drives an enormous surge into our nation's capital, as we model it. And this would show you that happening actually over a, a riverine tidal cycle. <coughs> That's the addition. Wow. So our nation's leadership, including our national security apparatus and people, 
Will I have a hard time getting to work that day? <laughs> uh, and for days following. So again, this is a fluent group. You're here for this purpose. At times I show this and people scratch their heads and that's not possible. But that's New York after Sandy. And I know we have the mayor's office here. Right, so it's not inconsistent with a tropical storm. Again, that's, that's not a Cat 3. That's not a hit. But this is at least something that we would expect with the increasing frequency. So to understand this, there's a lot going on with floods, a lot, tons of components, but elevation matters a lot. Every foot has a rough estimate, we say it adds about a third of exposure. Uh, in Florida, the world's biggest concentration of risk because of frequency, severity, and insured values. My bar has a lot of frequency, but not the insured values. Every foot makes a difference. And understanding that well is really important. But we are relying heavily on flood maps drawn literally with blue pencil in the 1970s. Okay. Since Sandy, good investments underway begun contemplated the 2012 flood bill to better map the elevation. But these efforts, as I, I bet this group knows, are threatened by the budget proposal, which is now up for September. But from there, who knows? So who will bridge this gap? Private sector actors, universities? These efforts are important both for life safety and for land use planning and the decisions of the governments, but also to grow a market. Uh, we well invest in what I aspire to be a superior model, but we need other players to have good models or we can't transact. <coughs> Only we have a point of view, there won't be a trading market, there won't be liquidity. We need other actors to have a reasonably robust view of the risk. And in this case, that also includes natural structures. Because we were crowded out of this market in the US for 50 years, we haven't made the investments in understanding the data that we've done for other things, but the government has. Because of FEMA's role, because of uh, HUD, and share, finding ways to appropriately share non-personal information with the private market is one way we can accelerate this really exciting private market opportunity. Okay. As Adam noted, all sorts of people are investing in this, it's not just us, and we're increasingly open to open source. Again, we need a, a market of shared understanding and development. Um, while I focused on flood and my time signals going up, uh, this dynamic of government entities absorbing risk and undermodeling seismic risk runs across a series of agencies. And I know the gentleman there asked about Fannie and Freddie. And aside, actually, the biggest default risk in the country may be the quake risk embedded in Fannie and Freddie, but the underinsured flood risk is also important. It's important in the flood program, the crop insurance program, and the range. This paper from the last couple of months of the prior administration from the Office of Management and Budget does a really excellent job of outlining what some of those exposures are. And giving some policy choices to make America safer and grow private market opportunities as well. <coughs> Government insurance tends to send perverse land use signals, but private market risk-based insurance is aligned with also valuing more appropriately natural capital, green infrastructure, uh, which is why there's some interest in us, we're uh, honored by this, from environmental groups, who I'm sure are not super passionate about reinsurance, but do want to use market tools to send better land use signals. So I commend these reports, which are done from Florida Wildlife and National Wildlife, but they're not the only ones done this. Nature Conservancy does some great work in the uh, Paulson group paper that Adam showed is terrific. Um, I'm out of time, but I do want to uh, take one of your moments on a related issue of, of personal importance to me, the amount of Americans who are harm's away from climate change. We spend a lot of time at meetings like this talking about financing risk, Financing it, it more in a more smart way, but you know, can we drop some of the subsidies for vacation homes in the Hamptons? Right. That's important topics. They're important to grow the mind business, but we spend almost no time talking about the number of Americans who are literally in harm's way in, against risks that are increasing all the time. Uh, we've lost more Americans to climate-related disasters in the United States since 9/11 than we have to terrorism at home. And uh, those of us with means have lots of options to evacuate. Americans with less means, in effect, we tell them to stay in place. Go to the Superdome. Stay in your walk-up. Stay put. So we did that for Katrina. We did it for Sandy. We did it with the floods, the rain-driven floods in Louisiana last year. Right now, we're going to do it for the next Sandy. But we can fix this. And we can help our, our fellow Americans both have affordable insurance and homes and places that are safer, but be prepared to get in the way of the inevitable next event. So with that point of privilege, I'll close and thank you for uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay, I know you're all jonesing for coffee break, but I think we just uh, take out a couple of questions if we if we have them. Please. I'm uh, Manuel Lewin with uh, Zurich Insurance with uh, the Zurich Insurance Company on the asset side, not on the liability side. Um, given the limitations that we've heard from the previous speakers, uh, 
at, at which point do you think insurance can actually price the, the climate change related risks into premiums? Uh, uh, well, first, uh, Zurich does great work in the space on the liability side, so thanks for everything that your, your company does. I think we have a lot of runway. Um, through diversification, you know, we, we can, what I think I hear in your question is there's some point where the reinsurance sector wants to withdraw from the market, is that? That might be an ultimate consequence. If permitted to do our jobs, if permitted to quote prices we think are risk adequate, I don't see a runway for reinsurance to withdraw. But the political consequences, at least in some areas of quoting risk adequate prices, are the, the challenge to maintenance and growth that we see. But if you can combine Florida risk with Japanese earthquake, you can make Florida storms more affordable immediately. Right? A truly diversified portfolio sends good signals, but also makes it more affordable. So we, we have decades to run here. But importantly, I'd suggest it's important to let that happen. Risk-based reinsurance and other financing signals are inherently pro-adaptive. I encourage you to think about us as, as a green security. And what we've done in some areas of the economy, home heating oil, is price home heating oil, for example, with market signals but help people out with vouchers so they know what it costs, but on a means-tested basis, they're able to afford it. The flood program is not means-tested. You can have multiple vacation homes and qualify for homeowner's insurance. Yeah, there are lots of opportunities to have meaningful form. And there are five and a half million policies in the flood insurance program. 1.2 of them admit they're a second home. There's a lot of opportunity there. Um, one last question. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can address this, but the role of catastrophe bonds in helping municipalities to deal with the risk. Thank you. So cap bonds is jargon for a bond, and they're, they're bonds, they're fixed income instruments that respond upon the occurrence frequently of an index-based event. So New York City event would pay out frequently, say, $10 million. So it takes out some of the basis risk. How did you manage the claims? You know. mm -hmm. Uh, I think they can help a lot. It's a rapidly growing asset class, the jargon that we use, risk is now an asset class. We have encouraged municipalities to explore catastrophe bonds linked to infrastructure. So if you have any doubts that this Congress, this administration would rapidly repair New York's in infrastructure after the next Sandy, the market would respond quickly if you invested in market-based tools. So uh, catastrophe bonds are increasingly prevalent worldwide. Infrastructure is much more prevalent outside of the United States than it is inside the United States currently. Okay, with that, um, Larry gets a question. Oh, okay. uh, this is a question for Adam. Um, Thanks. This is a question for Adam. So you're studying uh, what you call catastrophes for which there's historical data. But if you look beyond the next few decades, there's a feeling in the scientific community, and this is well studied and documented, uh, that we're going to face phenomena which, for which there's no historical data since we're getting outside of that zone. So major ecosystem changes, loss of Arctic sea ice, big ice sheet melts, changes in currents and flows and so on, uh, many of which are now thought to be improbable during the century, but we really don't know. Could you comment on the state of the science, if you will, and uh, uh, what kind of work is going on in that and how one could think about approaching it? Well, so, I mean, um, the, in terms of catastrophe modeling um, for specific natural hazards, as I was um, trying to say, the, we're very much trying to address exactly what you said. That's the limitation of the current catastrophe model, at least as using the industry, is that they are based on historical data. We're trying to base them more on physics because that's the only thing we really have for predicting the future. We can't predict the future from extrapolating from the past. We have to use physics. So, so we're going in that direction. In terms of what the state of the science is, you raise several different things. I mean, ecosystems and ice shells, and each of those, the state of the science is different, and some of those, uh, you know, many of them I'm not an expert in, and other people in the room may be. So each of those has its own, um, own state of the science. You know, as Peter said, the weather, sea level rise is going to go up very fast, including the largest risk, which is that our overall understanding of the climate sensitivity, the be our best estimate might be low, and the overall pace of climate change might be faster than we think it is. That's a sort of one big risk. I guess my, the only comment I'll make is, you know, each of these problems, we're using all the science we have, looking at paleo data, looking at historical data, and, and using physics as we express it in various kinds of <coughs> mathematical models. But on all of them, it's best posing the problem as risk. I think this is really the right way to frame the public debate, and it gets lost a lot. We sometimes hear, well, the science is uncertain, 
So that's an excuse not to do anything. That makes no sense. I think people in, that work in, you know, in the industries represented in this room understand that. You don't, the fact that something uncertain means you have to worry about the worst case scenario. You don't just think, well, it could be the best case. You know, maybe the guys are wrong and it'll be better than they say. It might also be worse, right? So the, the language of risk is really how we have to communicate and think about this problem. And with each individual scientific problem, you know, the, we have to do the best we can. But we have to always understand that the uncertainty is, is a motivator for action rather than the converse.